economists will tell you that the more information you have, the more options you have, the better the choices you will make. And what I'm going to tell you is that, in fact, that's really not true, because the structure and function of our brains place very strong constraints on the kinds of decisions we can make, and they shape our behavior very strongly in ways that we are completely unaware of. Now, traditional approaches to understanding what's going on in our heads when we make decisions, relying on psychology, right, surveys, asking people questions, these are very limited in terms, these approaches are very limited in terms of the insights they give into what's actually going on in your head, because people either don't have very good access to what is driving their behavior, or they don't want to tell you. Okay, as an experimenter, we know that if you ask people questions, they often don't want to reveal what's actually motivating them. And so my proposition, and the proposition that we have at the Wharton Neuroscience Initiative, is that if we understand more about the human brain, how it's structured, how it functions, and we can actually tap into those brain signals, we can amplify on our ability to understand what's actually driving people's behavior. Okay? And one thing that we have learned over the last, say, 10 years, is that, in fact, our brain physiology limits and constrains the number of options we can usefully, usefully consider. So this uh, is often known as the tyranny of choice, in which when you are confronted with a bewildering array of options, as in a, you know, in a typical convenience store, you have trouble making a decision, it takes you a long time, and you often feel bad about it afterward. This is not some outcome of psychological irrationality. It just reflects the very fact that brains are limited in terms of the energy that they can expend on any one option. And so what our brains do is to uh, normalize or divide out the value of any one option we're considering by the number and value of alternative options available. It's just the way brains work, down to the level fundamentally of neurons. So think about when you're confronting something like uh, in the US, uh, in California last week, the so-called jungle primary in which there were dozens and dozens of candidates running for each office. Okay, that fundamentally challenges the ability of any brain, any human brain, to make a reasonable decision. Now, this same principle of physiological constraints also accounts for what are known as decoy effects in decision making. Okay, what's a decoy effect? A decoy effect is when you have two options, one of which is clearly preferred to the other, like a cheap bottle of wine to a more expensive one. If you now add a third option to the set that's much more expensive and that you would never consider, that often shifts people's choices okay, to the option they wouldn't have chosen. This is a f just falls out precisely from these energetic constraints and this normalization process that occurs in the brain. Now, when we think about uh, kind of traditional um, uh, voting processes in, in the United States, for example, where you might have two candidates, the addition of a third-party candidate who is more extreme than either of the other two, like uh, Gary Johnson on some uh, dimensions, can shift people's choices from what they had originally preferred to another option. So when we consider choice sets that are presented in the voting booth, right, we need to take these into consideration, these just pure physiological constraints. Now, another big domain in which our brains are strongly influenced right, in the decisions we make are the social domain. And when we are making choices about who we want to elect for government, right, our brains are actually responding spontaneously and unconsciously to information about those individuals. And one of the really great um, discoveries over the last 10 or 15 years in neuroscience is that we now know that there is a dedicated circuit in our brains that is devoted to dealing with other people. Okay, it's often known as the social brain network. This circuit is responsible for identifying who's around us, remembering them, paying attention to them, and ultimately understanding their experience through empathy, and also making or forming a mental model of what they might be thinking, which both of those together guide how we respond to them. Do we help them or not? Do we cooperate or not? Now, it's really interesting to consider this social brain network when we think about all the ways in which others are currently affecting our behavior. So when we think about uh, the migrant crisis uh, here in Europe uh, or in the United States, how do our brains respond to people okay, who we don't normally run across, people from different ethnic groups, for example? And so I'm going to turn to some work that was done by a postdoctoral fellow in my lab back when he was a graduate student, 
uh, in China, and he did a very simple experiment. He had people watch the following two videos. I just want you to watch the videos, okay? And you can think to yourself what you feel. Okay, so here's one video. I saw a couple of uh, sad responses <laughs> in the audience. Okay, here's another video. Okay. So what did people feel? Anybody? Does that look like a pleasant experience? First of all, I have to tell you that these are fake needles. They actually just push up into the syringe, and nobody was actually injured uh, during, this, um, during this study. So what, what my postdoc, Feng Sheng, did was he had uh, people who were either ethnically uh, Caucasian or ethnically Chinese watch these two videos. He asked them what they felt, okay, and they felt like what people here in the audience probably said they felt. That felt painful. I didn't like that. I empathized with that person. But what he found when he looked in their brains using brain imaging, uh, and he focused on a particular part of the brain that's identified with empathy, and we know that activity in this part of the brain uh, predicts how likely you are to help somebody that you see in pain, he found that here on the left, in an ethnically Chinese observer, watching a Chinese woman apparently, excuse me, penetrate with a needle, you see a big brain empathy response, and nothing for watching a Caucasian individual penetrate with a needle, and exactly the opposite. Okay, for Caucasian observers seeing a Caucasian person penetrate with a needle, big brain empathy response, somebody from another ethnic group, nothing. This is really, really, I mean, I find this very disturbing. This is uh, really kind of challenging, and unfortunately, I think, hits home with a lot of our experiences, I think, uh, very recently. But it's not all to be despaired, so it turns out that there are ways that you can rescue this brain empathy response, and one way you can do it is to emphasize the commonalities that you share with an individual. And so in a simple experiment that Fung did was he, he repeated this other race effect on empathy, but he had the person in the video either wearing the same colored t-shirt as the subject or a different colored t-shirt. So if the individual is wearing a different colored t-shirt, you got the same blunting of empathy for somebody from the opposite, uh, from another ethnic group. But now they're on the same team, and you rescue that brain empathy response. Now, we don't know how, that, how long that lasts. We don't know, you know all the dimensions that it might apply to, but it suggests the very real possibility that policies and practices that emphasize inclusion and humanizing other people, people from other uh, ethnic groups, will go a long way toward rescuing this empathy response. And I see that I'm really way behind on time, so I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna keep pushing forward. Uh, another way in which our social brain network is shaped by, um, by our context is power differential. So power, social dominance, socioeconomic differences powerfully shape and regulate the way our social brain networks actually process information about others. And one way that's really, really important and interesting is that it, it changes the way that we take the perspective of other individuals. So in a, in a classic uh, experiment by Adam Galinsky from NYU, he asked people to remember a time or to imagine a time when they felt very powerful and then write the letter E on their forehead uh, so that somebody else could read it. So if they were thinking about being powerful, they wrote the E from their own perspective. And then if they were not thinking about being powerful, they wrote the letter E in a way that would be readable by somebody else. So assuming, just, just thinking about being powerful, uh, reduced perspective taking. Now this is something that's deeply baked into our brains deeply wired in. So we have shown the exact same thing in monkeys, not with writing letters, but instead, uh, if you look at the likelihood that a monkey will actually turn and shift his gaze in the direction that another monkey is doing it, it's, it's a very basic form of perspective taking. High power monkeys don't do that. They don't follow the gaze of anyone except high power monkeys. Low power monkeys follow the gaze, take the perspective of everyone. And we now know from the work of Matt Lieberman and Emily Falk, that uh, brain imaging shows that activity in the social brain network falls off as people are more powerful. So the, this is a rating scale. Basically, think of yourself on a ladder. Uh, the higher up on the ladder, the higher ranking you are. People who are the highest ranking in this study, self-report, show the lowest activity in this social brain network, which we know is responsible for processing information about other individuals. So finally, I want to turn to a study that is ongoing in our lab where we're thinking about how we can use some of this information to build emotional rapport, to build empathy, not necessarily just between people, but between people, uh, for example, and a political party. And our, uh, our hypothesis is, is that, in fact, we use this same social brain network, 
to bond with, to form an emo emotional connection uh, with a political party. And we've actually been testing that not with political parties right now, but with products and brands. Uh, and so we've uh, asked the question to people who are either uh, Apple iPhone users or Samsung Galaxy users, we have them see, a, they're lying in a brain scanner, an MRI machine, and they're hearing positive and negative news about either their brand or the other brand. And people basically report strong empathy for their brand. Oh, I'm an Apple user, something good happens, stock goes up, I feel good, stock goes down, I feel bad, but not so much for Samsung. Same thing for Samsung users. But kind of surprisingly, what we find is that their brains tell a different story. So if we look on the left here, Apple customers who hear good news about Apple, we see activity in reward areas of the brain. They see bad news about Apple. They see, we see activity in pain areas in the brain, and nothing when they hear news of, about Samsung. But now look at about our Samsung customers. They hear good news about Samsung, there's nothing. No activity in reward areas. They hear bad news about Samsung, nothing. No activity uh, in pain areas. And in fact, what we do see is the opposite, sort of uh, reverse empathy or schadenfreude for hearing news about Apple. And if we go beyond that and just look at what the activity in, in these individuals' brains when they're hearing news about their preferred brand or not, for Apple, anytime an individual sees Apple, Apple news, it activates a part of their brains that's involved in their own self-identity and personal value. In Samsung users, it's thinking about other people. Okay, so what has Apple done? Apple, Apple's won the game here. Apple has created a sense of identity and inclusion within a group that evokes strong empathy for the brand. And Samsung has not done that. That means a third um, brand could come in and easily steal these Samsung customers. So think about that from the perspective of politics, right? How can we use some of these techniques to help us to understand and build better, stronger uh, emotional connections uh, between uh, political parties, for example, and, um, and ourselves, and that's something that we're actually testing in the lab right now. So uh, I'm probably over time. I'm not gonna read these to you. Take our phones out, uh, take a picture, uh, and you can uh, take it home with you, and you'll, you'll remember everything that I said. So um, thanks for your time.